the theme of the traitor and the hero. So the platonic year whirls out new right and wrong, whirls in the old instead. All men are dancers, and their tread goes to the barbarous clangor of a gong. W.B. Yeats, The Tower. Under the notorious influence of Chesterton, inventor and embellisher of elegant mysteries, and the court councillor Leibniz, who invented pre-established harmony, in my spare evenings I have conceived this plot, which I will perhaps commit to paper, but which seems already somehow justifies me. It needs details, rectifications, tinkering. There are areas of the story that have never been revealed to me. Today, January 3, 1944, I see it in the following way. The action takes place in an oppressed yet stubborn country, Poland, Ireland, the Republic of Venice, some South American or Balkan state. Or took place, rather, for though the narrator is contemporary, the story told by him occurred in the mid or early 19th century, in 1824, let us say, for convenience's sake, in Ireland, let us also say. The narrator is a man named Ryan, the great-grandson of the young, heroic, beautiful, murdered Fergus Kilpatrick, whose grave was mysteriously violated, whose name gives luster to Browning's and Hugo's verses, and whose stature stands high upon a grey hilltop among red bogs. Kilpatrick was a conspirator, and a secret and glorious captain of conspirators. Like Moses, who from the land of Moab glimpsed, yet could not reach the promised land, Kilpatrick perished on the eve of the victorious rebellion he had planned for and dreamed of. The date of the first centenary of his death is approaching. The circumstances of the crime are enigmatic. Ryan, who is writing a biography of the hero, discovers that the enigma goes deeper than mere detective work can fathom. Kilpatrick was murdered in a theatre. The English police never apprehended the assassin. Historians claim that this failure does not tarnish the good name of the police, since it is possible that the police themselves had Kilpatrick murdered. Other aspects of the mystery disturb Ryan. Certain things seem almost cyclical, seem to repeat, or combine events from distant places, distant ages. For example, everyone knows that the constables who examined the hero's body found a sealed letter warning Kilpatrick not to go to the theatre that night. Julius Caesar, too, as he was walking toward the place where the knives of his friends awaited him, received a note he never read, a note telling him of his betrayal and revealing the names of his betrayers. Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, saw in dreams a tower felled by order of the Senate. On the eve of Kilpatrick's death, false and anonymous rumours of the burning of the circular tower of Kilgarvan spread throughout the country, an event that might be taken as an omen, since Kilpatrick had been born in Kilgarvan. These and other parallels between the story of Julius Caesar and the story of an Irish conspirator induce Ryan to imagine some secret shape of time, a pattern of repeating lines. His thoughts turn to the decimal history conceived by Condorcet, the morphologies proposed by Hegel, Spengler, and Vico, mankind as posited by Hesiod, degenerating from gold to iron. He thinks of the transmigration of souls, a doctrine that lends horror to Celtic literature, and that Caesar himself attributed to the Druids of Britain. He toys with the idea that before Fergus Kilpatrick was Fergus Kilpatrick, he was Julius Caesar. He is saved from those circular labyrinths by a curious discovery, a discovery which, however, will plunge him deep into another, yet more tangled and heterogeneous mazes. It seems that certain words spoken by a beggar who spoke with Fergus Kilpatrick on the day of his death had been prefigured by Shakespeare in Macbeth. The idea that history might have copied history is mind-boggling enough. That history should copy literature is inconceivable. Ryan digs further, and he finds that in 1814, James Alexander Nolan, the oldest of the hero's comrades, had translated Shakespeare's major plays into Gaelic, among them 
Julius Caesar. He also finds in the archives a manuscript article by Nolan on the Swiss Festspieler, vast peripatetic theatrical performances that require thousands of actors and retell historical episodes in the same cities, the same mountains in which they occurred. Another unpublished document reveals to Ryan that a few days before the end, Kel Patrick, presiding over the last gathering of his chiefs, had signed the death sentence of a traitor whose name has been scratched out. This sentence does not jibe with Kilpatrick's customary mercifulness. Ryan investigates the matter, his investigation being one of the gaps in the book's narration, and manages to decipher the enigma. Kilpatrick was murdered in a theatre, yet the entire city played the role of theatre, too, and the actors were legion, and the play that was crowned by Kilpatrick's death took place over many days and many nights. Here is what happened. On August 2, 1824, the conspirators met. The country was ripe for rebellion. Something, however, always went awry. There must have been a traitor within the inner circle. Fergus Kilpatrick had given James Nolan the job of ferreting out the identity of this traitor, and Nolan had carried out his mission. He announced to the gathered comrades that the traitor was Kilpatrick himself. He proved the truth of his accusation beyond the shadow of a doubt, and the men at the council that night condemned their leader to death. The leader signed his own death sentence, but he pleaded that his punishment not harm the cause. And so it was that Nolan conceived a strange plan. Ireland idolized Kilpatrick. The slightest suspicion of his baseness would have compromised the rebellion. Nolan proposed a way to turn the traitor's execution into an instrument for the emancipation of the country. He proposed that the condemned man die at the hands of an unknown assassin in deliberately dramatic circumstances. Those circumstances would engrave themselves upon the popular imagination and hasten the rebellion. Kilpatrick swore to collaborate in this plan which would give him an occasion to redeem himself, and which would be crowned by his death. Nolan had no time to invent the circumstances of the multiple execution from scratch, and so he plagiarized the scene from another playwright, the English enemy, Will Shakespeare, reprising scenes from Macbeth and Julius Caesar. The public, yet secret performance, occurred over several days. The condemned man entered Dublin, argued, worked, prayed, reprehended, spoke words of pathos, and each of those acts, destined to shine forth in glory, had been choreographed by Nolan. Hundreds of actors collaborated with the protagonist. The role of some was complex, the role of others a matter of moments on the stage. The things they did and said endure in Ireland's history books and in its impassioned memory. Kilpatrick moved almost to ecstasy by the scrupulously plotted fate that would redeem him and end his days, more than once enriched his judge's text with improvised words and acts. Thus, the teeming drama played itself out in time until that August 6, 1824, in a box, prefiguring Lincoln's, draped with funereal curtains, when a yearned-for bullet pierced the traitor hero's breast. Between two spurts of sudden blood, Kilpatrick could hardly pronounce the few words given him to speak. In Nolan's play, the passages taken from Shakespeare are the least dramatic ones. Ryan suspected that the author interpolated them so that someone in the future would also be able to stumble upon the truth. Ryan realized that he, too, was part of Nolan's plot. After long and stubborn deliberation, he decided to silence the discovery. He published a book dedicated to the hero's glory. That, too, perhaps, had been foreseen.